on a chilly Thursday morning in November of 2002. A United Airlines flight took off from Paris en route to Boston, Massachusetts. On final approach to Boston's Logan International Airport, the fully loaded airliner exploded right over the city of Boston. The bomb was a dirty bomb, one that combined traditional explosives with radioactive material, able to contaminate a wide area of land and render it completely uninhabitable due to high radiation. Effectively, making Boston a new Chernobyl. Police, firefighters, and emergency medical services, or EMS, along with 14 Boston hospitals, were forced to rapidly intercept and treat these patients, some of whom required nuclear decontamination. The incident was a complete surprise, leaving the city of Boston and the world in shock that day. Now, you might be scratching your head. Did I completely miss hearing about a nuclear attack on a major US city in 2002? <laughs> Don't worry, you're not going crazy. This was just a training exercise, a realistic but fake terrorist attack designed to test Boston's medical response and improve on existing disaster plans. In fact, Boston's practiced its response to over 70 similar mass casualty scenarios since then including to natural disasters, train derailments, mass shootings, even events as specific as a bomb during the Boston Marathon. Well, on April 15th, 2013, we we're pretty grateful that they practiced that last one. That day, two bombs hit the finish line of the 117th Boston Marathon. Despite no warnings of the attack, Boston's disaster response was impeccable, planned and executed down to the T, a rapid and orderly response to the chaos from the smoke and screams of the explosions on the streets. The first improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, to ever explode on US soil. Today, I want to tell you about the details of that response. How were hundreds of blast victims treated so quickly? What rehearsed emergency plans were executed that day? And despite the three individuals who lost their lives almost instantly by the blast on the scene, how did every single other person who made it to a hospital that day survive, despite injuries like blown off limbs and massive hemorrhage? My name is Umang Jain. I'm a fourth year medical student at Northwestern right here in Chicago. And I'm going, to, I'm going into emergency medicine next year. I was born and raised in the suburbs of Boston. And no matter where I live in my life, that city will always be home to me. Go Pats. So when I was here in Chicago, sitting on my couch on that Monday in April of 2013, I was terrified. Imagine seeing your hometown and not being able to recognize any of it. Just to let you know, some of these next pictures are a little graphic. My eyes were glued to the screen, where bloody people were running away as fast as they could from clouds of smoke, news headlines screaming, bombs hit Boston Marathon. My hands shook as I picked up my cell phone and tried to decide who to call first. My parents? my sister, or my friends, some of whom live only a few blocks away from those explosions. Who would you call first in that situation? Thankfully, my family and friends were safe that day. But not everyone was so lucky. There was blood on the streets of my hometown, and underneath my confusion, in my fury, the only thing I could think about was, I really hope Boston had a plan for something like this or else a lot of people are going to die today. This is the story of the Boston Marathon response. At 2.49 PM, the first bomb exploded. The second exploded 13 seconds later and a block away from the first. The bombs were IEDs, pressure cookers filled with nails, ball bearings, and black powder connected to a detonator. 
When the detonator was pushed, the black powder exploded. Gases rapidly heated up and expanded, and a shockwave was created, which spread outwards, burst through the pressure cooker, and released the nails and ball bearings at a speed of one kilometer per second in all directions. The combination of the debris and the shockwave had the power to knock people down, throw them in the air, blow off limbs, and cause blunt and penetrating trauma to the body and the brain. It was pure and utter chaos. Boston Police and EMS enacted their emergency protocol. They stopped the race. A medical tent near the finish line, normally a site to treat just sore and dehydrated runners after the race, was transformed into a casualty collection zone. After years of IED explosions in Iraq and Afghanistan, EMS had learned to place tourniquets and in blast injury patients to help control hemorrhage. They expanded their communications network and called on private ambulances to help. They used green, yellow, and red tags to stratify the patients in terms of the severity of their injuries. They moved those 30 critically ill or red tagged patients within just 18 minutes of the explosions. The rest of the victims were transported to Boston's six level one trauma centers within two miles of the blast site. EMS coordinated its plan so that each one of these hospitals knew ahead of time exactly how many patients they would be receiving and what types of injuries they would have. Now, keep in mind, Boston boasts some of the best hospitals in the United States. But an explosion like this one had the ability to overwhelm even the best. Major injuries included embedded shrapnel, burns, open fractures, and fully amputated limbs. Minor injuries included ear barotrauma, or a burst eardrum, and severe anxiety attacks. And to make matters even worse, two of these hospitals, Mass General Hospital and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, you might have heard of them, had entirely full emergency rooms and operating rooms before the explosions. Word of the explosions first got to the hospitals over a system called CMED. CMED is the standard radio frequency EMS uses to alert ER staff ahead of time of what types of patients they'll be receiving and what sorts of injuries they have. Dr. Emily Aronson, Dr. Emily Aronson is an emergency medicine physician who was working in the Brigham's ER that day. After a loud beep overhead to alert staff, CMED announced that a severely injured patient was coming in. It went off once. It sounded severe, but wasn't something that we hadn't seen before. But then it went off again, and again, and again. This was how it all began. Hospitals initiated Code Amber. That's the indication for a hospital-wide disaster response. The first task was to clear the emergency room of the current and less critically ill patients. So while these patients were moved to other wards, custodial staff rapidly cleaned rooms, and nurses and residents located extra ultrasound machines, tourniquets, and blood. One physician at the Brigham who recalled the 2008 Mumbai attacks in which hospitals were targeted after a mass shooting, directed Brigham security to lock down the hospital. And in case those explosions in Boston turned out to be radioactive, he had the Brigham's hazmat decontamination unit opened as well. Trauma surgeons, orthopedists, and anesthesiologists flooded the ER and joined ER staff to form teams standing at the ready to survey patients from head to toe. All of this happened before the first patient even presented to Brigham's ER, just 14 minutes after the hospital was first notified of the explosions. Now, with the marvels of modern healthcare, when a patient walks into the ER, it only takes two or three minutes to get them established into the electronic medical record, or EMR. But the problem that day was that some victims were so badly injured 
that they couldn't even give simple identifying information like their name. And they definitely didn't have time for a long registration process. So Mass General Hospital had a solution for this. They opened disaster packs. The disaster packs had scannable wristbands with unique pre-made medical record numbers on them that served as the patient's identifiers in the record. So for each incoming disaster patient, a wristband was put on them. And overall, we're able to save time by eliminating the need for registration at all. The packs also had a few other things. They had sheets so nurses could help record vitals, to request lab samples, and to send for imaging. And everything in that disaster pack was color-coded based on the severity of the patient's condition. Again, green, yellow, and red, so that anybody just walking by in the ED and glancing at that patient could tell immediately how severe their condition was. Patients flooded the emergency room. And each team assessed and stabilized each one of those patients. One man was in particularly bad shape. He suffered an open fracture to his right ankle, burns, and severe facial wounds. To make matters worse, the man was taking Coumadin at home, a common blood thinner used to treat cardiovascular disease and a drug that will make you hemorrhage a lot more quickly than normal. While an ER physician intubated the patient or put a tube down his throat to help him breathe, a trauma surgeon placed a blood pressure cuff as a tourniquet on the man's right thigh to help control that hemorrhage. At the same time, a plastic surgeon performed a lateral canthotomy, a procedure to cut the tendons around the man's eyeball to relieve the fatal pressure from blood pooling up behind it. Oh yeah, and a nurse was giving him blood at the same time. Upstairs in the operating rooms, Medical directors coordinated the flow of critical patients directly from the ERs into the ORs, bypassing any of the middle preoperative areas. This was a time-saving method that they had learned in previous disaster drills. This allowed for Mass General Hospital to transport five critically ill patients directly from the emergency rooms into their own operating rooms within just eight minutes of each other. Every single victim who made it to a hospital that day survived. Because the system was set up for success, providers could rely on their training and their instincts, and no single provider had to know what another one was doing for the system to work effectively. If EMS, doctors, nurses, surgeons, custodial staff weren't able to passionately do their jobs that day, or were forced to take on responsibilities outside their own specialties, then more victims than any victim at the hospital could have died that day. In essence, this was an award-winning performance of a well-rehearsed play with a diverse and talented cast who knew their roles down cold. In fact, Dr. Paul Bittinger, the medical director for emergency preparedness at Mass General Hospital said, that while his hospital, MassGen, received 31 patients in that first hour, it could have accommodated even more if necessary. That's a bold statement. Boston succeeded in its response not only because it practiced these scenarios in the past, but also because they reviewed the responses to disasters in other cities around the world. About 10 years ago, the main idea behind disaster response in Boston was, hey, let's just wait for the patients to come into the ER after that disaster, and then, and then we'll figure out what to do. Let's not initiate any major protocols before that. In 2005, MassGen invited some consultants from Israel to talk about how their hospitals responded to frequent explosions on the ground there. That wait and see strategy, that didn't work for the Israelis. Bomb victims there were so badly injured that they would bleed out and die before getting proper medical treatment because they were forced to wait and register before coming into the emergency room. 
In 2008 and 2009, Boston also heard from experts from London, Madrid, and Mumbai who echoed the same sentiments. So it was clear, MassGen needed to overhaul its entire disaster protocol. EMS, the EMS's strategy to distribute an equal number of patients to each one of those six level one trauma hospitals and let those hospitals know ahead of time of what sorts of injuries they, they were receiving grew directly out of that improvement effort. The Brigham and Women's Hospital wasn't far behind. They were trying to improve their disaster responses as well. They analyzed the 2012 mass shooting in the Aurora, Colorado movie theater, in which 23 critically ill patients were transported to an emergency room in just one hour. The Brigham reimagined the scenario happening in, happening in Boston, and they tailored their response. Less than a year later at the Boston Marathon explosions, exactly 23 critically ill patients presented to Brigham's ER in that first hour, all of whom survived. The hospital directly attributed some of its success that day to the changes they made after analyzing Aurora's response. Cities around the world, like Boston, are only getting more and more crowded, filled with people, buildings, trains, cars, planes, boats, and soon even drones. The capacity for social and technological progress is unlimited. Cities are the center of this energy. It's fun to live in a city. I live in a city, and I like to have fun. But cities are also at the most risk because of this. Over the last few decades, we've seen terrorist attacks devastate population centers around the world. No matter where you're from, what political affiliation you hold, what religion you follow, or what war you're fighting, the one thing we can all agree on as citizens is the atrocity of a terrorist bomb hitting a major city and indiscriminately killing innocent people. The one thing that we can agree on is the need for a good disaster response. For that day in Boston, the preparation paid off. While I sat on my couch watching the smoke and screams on TV, hands shaking as I picked up my cell phone and tried to decide who to call first, little did I know that a massive effort was already underway to save all those lives. So this is the real Boston Marathon response. Two bombs exploded killing three people almost instantly and injuring 264 who were triaged by EMS and medical tent staff at the scene. A central operator coordinated the unequal distribution of those patients, the flow to six level one trauma centers within two miles of the blast site, moving the 30 most critically ill patients or red tag patients within just 18 minutes of the explosions. Hospitals initiated their disaster response, cleared out entirely full emergency rooms and operating rooms, gathered staff who could trust their instincts and their training and initiated rapid medical treatment. 36 operating rooms were active over six hospitals that afternoon. All life and limb saving procedures were completed before midnight and every single victim who made it to a hospital survived that day. And four days later, Boston police shut down the city, conducted a massive manhunt and arrested one of the terrorists responsible for the attack. And just last month, before the running of the proud 2015 Boston Marathon, that man was formally convicted and given a life sentence for his crimes. The preparation paid off. The emergency medical response was successful. And in the end, the city of Boston stood strong. Thank you.